Okay, so what's the story here? What I want to talk to you about is the fact that many, many policymakers and other people got up very upset with uh, economic theory uh, when the 2008 crisis hit, and it could well be that we're just starting a new one, but uh, what they uh, claimed was that the theory was n didn't help them when we got to a crisis. That is that it all seemed to be pretty nice when things were stable, but as soon as we got into a crisis, the theory didn't seem to work anymore. And the reason for this is, is a one that goes back a long way, over 200 years. And it is this belief that if you leave the system alone, if you let people do essentially what they want to do with very few constraints, then this system will self-organize itself into a nice, steady state. And that state will have certain properties. And this state is often referred to as optimal or efficient. And uh, this is all refers to the invisible hand of Adam Smith, who you remember from the Wealth of Nations. And my idea is to explain to you that in that view, there is no possibility of a crisis, no possibility of the system uh, uh, somehow getting out of hand unless it's hit by something from the outside. So something from the outside must hit the economy and then make it push it off, tra off track for a while. But in fact, what we know is that if you think about this, um, the economy in a different way, if you think about it as a system of individuals and firms who are interacting with each other all the time, and what one does affects another, if you think about it like that, then those sort of systems in physics, in biology and elsewhere, sometimes endogenously go through crisis periods. It's not because of some shock from the outside, it's because something evolved inside the system. And that's exactly what goes on in the economy. And so what we should do is not uh, worry so much about the individuals and how they optimize, but think about this whole system of little interacting people who may be very simple, but it's, it's they who produce the macroeconomic behavior. But to do that, you would have to change the whole paradigm of economics because what happens when you sit down in your first year? You're taught about the consumer, and the consumer makes his choices. He has a budget, but he's all alone. And then later on, in course year two, year three, you're st uh, they tell you about externalities. But those are sort of imperfections. You know, they, un they interfere with the economy. But in fact, externalities, the fact that I have an influence on what my neighbor does, and that everybody interacts together, are central to the economy. They're not just peripheral frictions. Okay, so I would suggest that we should be changing our paradigm. And so where does the system, the problem in economics come from? Well, it's because it is what we call a complex system that is made up of all these individuals who interact together and not just look at each individual separately and then add them up. That's what produces the problem. And those sort of systems don't have the aggregate characteristics that l look like an individual. You can't take, if you take an ant's nest, you take the typical ant and have a look at him. He won't tell you much about how the ant hill gets organized. And that's what's important. Okay, so the gap between the individual level and the aggregate level is real. They're different. The aggregate economy does not behave like an individual. And so, as they say on the London Underground, <laughs> mine the gap. And here's a different view. Bob Schiller, a Nobel Prize winner in economics, he says, look, an economy is a remarkably complex structure. The analogy between the brain and the computer is familiar, but we should make the same analogy between the computer and the economy. It's a network of people who communicate with each other via electronic and other connections, using our better understanding of the brain and the computer may help us to better understand how the economy works. And there's been a shift away from what Bob May, the famous uh, uh, specialist in ecological systems, who was the president of the Royal Society, he said, people used to believe that nature was one of these self-organizing systems. Leave it alone as much as possible, as long as man doesn't interfere, 
and it'll be nice and stable. And what he showed is that that's not true in nature either. Nature also has its catastrophes, has its internal upheavals, has its extinctions of, uh, of species and so forth. So these systems don't nicely organize themselves. And elsewhere in other systems, in, for example, biology, in uh, physics, we know that systems go through those sort of phase changes, but we haven't accepted that in economics. So we're faced with these very complex systems, and we have rather little control over them. People are always telling you, if we do this, then that will happen. But in general, it doesn't. And so we should be much more humble about making statements like that. And crises are an intrinsic part of our system. That is, we can't say, we look at the system and it's stable, and every now and then there's this trouble, but we just wait a bit. And this problem of fundamental instability is the one that we should take over from these other disciplines. So here are these two basic approaches. Um, what was that? I think it's probably my mummy. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, standard approach. Our models must be built on sound micro foundations. That you must have been told time, and all those of you who studied economics have been told that hundreds of times. And that's what Lucas made his reputation on. Just look at the individuals, and he said we should only make assumptions about individuals, not worry about making assumptions about the whole. And our individuals should satisfy the economists' axioms of rationality. Now, the economists' axioms of rationality are not what you mean by being rational. You remember, you, after you got through about three courses in economics, you came to a little bit more difficult, advanced microeconomics, and there you're told, well, people have uh, well-ordered preferences, and they're continuous, and they're monotonic, and they're convex, and all that stuff. You say, oh, right. And, and then you think to yourself, is that how people are? And then those people who don't believe it leave, and you're left with the guys who do believe it, <laughs> and, and those are the guys who become economists, and that's a problem. People optimize in these models in isolation. And that's completely wrong, as, as we know. People don't optimize in isolation. They're constantly influenced by other people and what's going on. Aggregate behavior in that model is like that of a rational representative agent. And the focus is on efficient outcomes. That's what we worry about. Is it efficient? Now think of the economy as a complex system. Individuals don't do these complicated uh, maximizations. What they do is follow rather simple rules. They adapt to their environment. They're not irrational. They don't act against their own interests, but they only have limited and largely local information. And aggregate behavior emerges from the interaction between these individuals. And the main problem in economics is not efficiency, it's coordination. How do all these millions of people in the economy, how do their activities ever get coordinated so that we get something systematic at the end. So optimization, I would say, at both the individual and collective level is illusory. We should really concentrate on coordination. But economists have spent a long time, and Nobel Prizes have been given for this, in devising mechanisms which will produce efficient outcomes. And a very good example is uh, the example of auctions you know that the problem with an auction is that you want the good to go to the person who values it most. So we thought that auctions uh, were a system which produced that beautiful outcome. But things can go wrong with these mechanisms. A small change in the assumptions or in the behavior can in, in fact cause what are often referred to as unintended consequences. So here is a little example. And what happens here is it is a building that's on fire. Now the chief fireman comes and he only has one trampoline to catch somebody who's uh, going to jump. And so he's done economics one. So he says, we should run an auction. That's what we do. <laughs> so we auction off the right to jump into this. And with a bit of luck, if I can get this to work properly, you should be able to see this. I hope. Yes, you may be able to see this. <laughs> Did I get it? No? Nope. Whoa, back. Here we go. Let me try again. I may need somebody with more subtle fingers than me.
<laughs> so, you <laughs> so you see that even with our carefully designed mechanisms, you get a slight change in what was happening, and it can cause very bad results. Okay, so why, why have we got into this state? Why, why did we start to produce models where we're so worried about efficient outcomes and looked in particular at equilibrium? I think it's because uh, for a long time now we've come to the idea that social and political liberalism are the goals that we want to get to. We want to have a system which is um, liberal in the sense that people can do more or less what they want with a few rules. And the, the argument has always been, if only we leave these people to themselves, this system will organize itself. But that's an assumption. It's not actually anything we've ever been able to prove. And that's uh, uh, the myth of the invisible hand. And I want to talk about two other things within that context, if I get around to it. Inequality, which emerges from this system, and incentives. Is it true that when people uh, have the right incentives, the system organizes itself like that? OK. so. Economics recently has been attacked from a number of different points of view. And the, one of the most um, aggressive was Paul Romer, the chief, of the chief economist of the World Bank until recently, when he resigned. Um, and we won't go into why that was. But uh, anyway, he was very strongly against the way economics has developed and, and claimed that we've gone backwards over the last 30 years. Then another friend of mine, Rick Bookstaber, has written a book uh, which came out with Princeton University Press called The End of Theory. And what he says is that we can't actually ever produce a model of the economy which is mathematically tractable and which we can analyze and get nice results from because of the nature of the beast. And uh, let Bob Solo, uh, at one point, started to talk about modern macroeconomic models. I don't go through this long quote, but you can read it when you get the thing. But the idea is this. What he says is if you, somebody comes along and says to you, look, I'm Napoleon. So the last thing you want to do is sit down with him and discuss the Battle of Austerlitz. Because otherwise, if you do that, you start to play the game that he is Napoleon. And he continues to believe that. And so he says the only way to treat people like Lucas and Sargent is to laugh, because you say the fundamental framework is ludicrous. So I respond by treating it as ludicrous, that is, by laughing at it, not to fall into the trap of taking it seriously and passing on to matters of technique. And Greg Mankiw, a well-known and by far from revolutionary eco economist, he said, uh, unfortunately, the sad truth is that the macroeconomic research of the past three decades has had a, only a minor impact on the practical analysis of monetary or fiscal policy. The fact that modern, by the way, he points out that it's not because people uh, who do monetary policy are not well trained. They all come from the best universities. They come from Chicago and places. So there's no uh, problem with their talent. The fact that modern macroeconomic research is not widely used in practical policy making is prima facie evidence that it is of little use for this purpose. The research may have been successful as a matter of science, but has not contributed significantly to macroeconomic engineering. How do we get there? Well, Adam Smith's invisible hand was the original sort of starting point. But if you look at what Adam Smith actually said, it's very far from being true that he was a pure free trade person. But as free trade became more and more a dominant way of looking at things, John Stuart Mill, Gladstone, and so forth, gradually people began to accept that that was a natural way of letting the economy orga organize itself. And so we perpetuated that myth that the economic system will organize itself efficiently. And what happens when it doesn't? People say, ah, it's because the economy isn't uh, without all those frictions. We have to remove things. We have to free markets up. Then it'll be OK. If we can only get the economy to look like our model, then it'll work. But that's a very strange way of working, right? To try and make the economy look like the territory look like the map. So there is a picture of the invisible hand. And, um, <laughs> 
But there's a, a fundamental misunderstanding, I think, which you find even with the most serious people, like Danny Roderick, who is a very a good and interesting economist. But he says the first fundamental theorem of welfare economics is a big deal because it actually proves the invisible hand hypothesis. Even Andreo Mascolel, one of the best economic theorists, referred to the fundamental theorem as the invisible hand theorem. But that's something that you should remember and never forget. And uh, Kaushi Basu, another uh, person who's far from uh, very uh, conventional, but even he says, if we have a competitive economy, economy where individuals choose freely, the equilibrium that will arise will be Pareto optimal. But we have no reason to believe that it will arise. And that's our problem. It's simply false. What we, the only thing we can say is, if an economy is at equilibrium, then we know something about that state, that it is efficient. But we don't know that if an economy is not in that state, it'll get there. We've never been able to prove that if you start out of equilibrium, you will get there. And we can't, I can't repeat it enough, that we just never uh, have been able to show that. And let me give you one last remark on that. Um, the l last result, which uh, there were several results by Andrea, Andrea Mascolel, Hugo Sonnenschein and company, who showed that it was not possible with our standard assumptions. But worse, Sari and Simon said, imagine that you wanted a mechanism that would take us from out of equilibrium into equilibrium. And what they showed was that will use an infinite amount of information. So you can't hope to have such an thing. Um, and you can understand why. Because you have millions of people, all of them getting their information. And how does that get translated into an equilibrium? And what they showed was that it doesn't. Okay, so Morishima said, you know, if you, it doesn't matter if you can prove that equilibrium exists. What you want to worry about is do we get there? And if you don't get there, this is just an intellectual exercise. How do we get around it? Well, you notice that, as I said to you before, whenever we're in difficulties, people say, we just have to make the um, market more like our models. And you should be very suspicious of that. And major crises are thought to be rare and probably due to major outside shocks. And I don't want to give you this long quote. You can read it at home in the bath or something. Um, but as he points out, macroeconomists got comfortable with the idea that fluctuations in macroeconomic aggregates are caused by imaginary shocks. And that's exactly the problem. So what are these exogenous macro shocks? Willem Boiter, who was a famous macroeconomist and was at the LSE as a professor, then became head of the Citigroup, um, chief economist of Citigroup, and he said, those of us who worry about endogenous uncertainty arising from the interactions of boundedly rational market participants cannot but scratch our heads at the, uh, the insistence of the mainline models that all uncertainty is exogenous and additive. You don't have to worry about exogenous shocks. You only need one thing, that you have positive feedback. That is, when somebody does something, that has an effect on somebody else, and that can accelerate the whole process. Instead of saying, what is the right price? Uh, what am I going to do at that price? Supposing you say, Ooh, the price went up. I think I'm going to react to that. I'm going to buy more because I think the price will go up even more. That simple sort of positive EPA will drive you away from equilibrium. Okay, and here's a very bad quote by uh, Paul Romo, which you want to keep when economists get out of hand. So he says, the trouble is not so much that macroeconomists say things are inconsistent with the fact. The real trouble is that other economists don't care that the macroeconomists don't care about the facts. An indifferent, uh, indifferent tolerance of obvious error is even more corrosive to science than committed advocacy of error. And uh, there we, uh, there's a long quote where uh, Roma uh, sort of kicks all his friends and uh, it became very unpopular as a result. And we're told that all these things are in fact all these troubles in the economy are, are really due to these exogenous shocks, which are often referred to as black swans. You may have heard of that expression. Black swans, very rare, probably mythical animals, but they're not mythical because I took the photo of that one in um, Australia. But there are very few of them around. So they're always referred to as black swans. 
Is it true that crises are, in fact, in the economy, rare events? Well, Alan Greenspan, in 2010, said, with notably rare exceptions, 2008, for example, the global invisible hand has created relatively stable exchange rates, interest rates, prices, and wage rates. And some nasty person on a blog said, with notably rare exceptions, Germany remained largely at peace with its neighbors during the 20th century. <laughs> And an even nastier guy said, with notably rare exceptions, Alan Greenspan has been right about everything. <laughs> so, as somebody in the New York Times said, it's like a defense lawyer arguing that while his client may have committed a few murders on one particular day, his conduct on all the other days of his life has been exemplary. <laughs> Confidence in our theory. You know, in 2003, Bob Lucas said uh, in his presidential address to the AEA, the central problem of depression prevention has been solved. So that was good. And um, <laughs> Ben Bernanke wrote a lot of, about the great moderation. That is, all the volatility in macroeconomic variables had essentially disappeared. So the question is, our models function pretty well during that period, but wouldn't any model have done so? If you teach somebody how to sail when there's no wind, he can do pretty well. The problem is when the wind gets up, that's when it's important to know how to sail. So the economic theory ship was thought of as being unsinkable. You may not recognize that, but that's the Titanic. <laughs> and when the crisis hit, The Economist, again, not the most revolutionary of journals, said, had this on his uh, cover, economic theory, which is melting down like an ice cream where it went wrong and how the crisis is changing it. Unfortunately, the crisis has not changed it very much. But Jean-Claude de Trichet, who was then the governor of the European Central Bank, Ah, yes, right, and he gave one at the OECD too. And even though he makes these somewhat revolutionary statements, in fact, he's a very conservative guy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? Yeah. You noticed? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Even the way he dressed, right? <laughs> yeah. But anyway, but it's actually quite a nice guy. But those people who don't speak French probably don't know that tricher means to cheat. And, <laughs> and uh, there was a well-known professor who was a friend of mine at uh, Paris Dauphine who was called uh, Larnac. You may have run across Larnac. And Larnac means the sting in... Um, in French. Uh, so what I always hoped was that Larnac would present somewhere with Trichet, cheating and stinging. You know. But anyway, Trichet said, when the crisis came, judgment and experience inevitably played a key role. And Adair Turner, who was the head of the UK Financial Services Authority, he said there was a dominant conventional wisdom that markets were always rational and self-equilibrating. And he said, I think that it was bad, or rather oversimplistic and overconfident economics that helped create the crisis. It's complacency. When people start to think we've got all of this under control, that's when you get into difficulties. And uh, sorry, even Her Majesty said, uh, you know, people, to her economists, people, you know, what went wrong? How come you didn't uh, forecast the severity of this crisis, nor even see it coming? And what did the British Academy reply? So in summary, Your Majesty, the failure to foresee the timing, extent, and severity of the crisis was principally the failure of the collective imagination of many bright people, that's them, um, <laughs> to, to, to understand the risk to the systems as a whole. But, you know, Her Majesty thought that she had scientific advisors and she uh, wasn't expecting to rely on their collective imagination. So let me give you a quick example. Um, you should tell me when I'm getting towards the end, Mark, because... Uh, yeah. Hi. How are we doing? Uh, you have uh, 30 minutes more. How? 30 minutes. 30? 3 -0? Oh, great. <laughs> right. Okay. Mario Draghi gave a speech um, at the, uh, wh when he became president of the European Central Bank. And what did he say? The euro is like a bumblebee. It can't fly. We have models that show that. But it did for a while. Now the bumblebee will have to graduate to being a real bee. And that's what it's doing. 
So this is very strange. So he thinks that the euro was uh, the bumblebee <laughs> was something we had mob, uh, models saying it doesn't fly. So as long as the models say it doesn't fly, it can't fly. And here you see a friend of mine drew this nice cartoon for me. He says, and here's Mario Draghi explaining to the bumblebee, are you sure you want to keep on doing this? You know, our, our model says you can't do that. <laughs> and the problem is we're so wedded to our models that when they don't correspond to empirical reality, we wonder what the problem with the evidence is. <laughs> if we have models saying bumblebees cannot fly, then we should modify bumblebees and not our models. <laughs> uh, this is this book I told you about, The End of Theory, by Rick Buchstaber. I strongly recommend it to you. And he's not a, 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 an academic economist, in fact. He's somebody who worked for a while on the financial markets. And then he built agent-based models for the US Treasury of the macroeconomy. And uh, now he's responsible for risk to uh, the uh, University of California Endowment Fund. And when he gave a talk at the OECD, somebody said, yes, but you know, in the big financial markets and serious markets, you know, then uh, will these sort of things that you're saying to us really work? And he said, well, my fund has in it over $100 billion. And so that's quite a lot of money. So if we move that around, it does actually have an effect on the markets. So I don't think you can say we're working in a world where we are of no importance. But I recommend this book to you. Very interesting and uh, also entertaining. So what he says is, is that in a non-ergodic world, you may not remember what ergodic means, but ergodic means that we have today a, a probability distribution over the events that happen. Then as we move forward in time, it's always the same probability distribution. So even though the, the process moves around, we know what the probabilities of the events are, okay? But in a non-ergodic world, that's not true that the probability of the different events change over time. And that's radical, and that's what happens in the, in the um, economy. And what he would su suggest is that we can't, in fact, build an overall model for a whole series of reasons he gives, logical, mathematical, and so forth, which would actually capture the way the economy works and so that we can say, if you do this, then that will happen. This is simply not possible in our uh, system. And uh, you remember the Hayek, who is um, actually not a person I appreciate greatly, but Hayek had this famous phrase, there are no laws in economics, there are just patterns. And that, I think, is absolutely right, that uh, we don't have laws in the usual sense. We do have patterns. We can observe the way in which things work, and we can try and recognize these patterns. But that's not the same as having laws in the scientific sense. And what um, Rick uh, Buxaba recommends is using heuristics for agents. And those of you who have ever heard about agent-based models know that what you do is you give people simple rules and they follow those. Now, usually, economists take their rules from inside their heads. But Rick says, no, but, you know, if you're modeling financial markets, we know who these people are. The big actors in the financial markets, they are people like Morgan Stanley, J.P. Morgan, uh, Goldman Sachs, and so forth. And we know what rules they use because they even advertise them. They even explain what their strategy is. Mm -hmm. So why should we bother with imagining the rules that these people use and not take them directly from reality? And that's something which economists don't like because what it means is that each model you build will be dependent on the particular world that you're building in. But when you change that world, you change that market, then you'll have to use the rules of the people who operate in that market. But that's probably a much more realistic and modest way to go. But all of this criticism has not really changed the way um, economists think. And the band is still playing on. And that's the Titanic at the end. OK. But sometimes when I'm giving this sort of talk, people say, yeah, but financial economics is much more serious. That's built on really solid theoretical grounds. We have all these physicists and mathematicians who build these very clever models, so they must have got it right. And what I would claim is that financial economics is on just as shaky grounds as theoretical economics. Now, what did Adam Smith have to say? Adam Smith was talking about the financial sector, and he says, the directors of banks, being the managers rather of other people's money than of their own, 
it cannot be well expected that they should watch over it with anxious vigilance. Negligence and profusion, therefore, must always prevail, more or less in the management of the affairs of such a company. So he's saying, as soon as you start to manage, manage other people's money, and that's what the financial sector's about, then things may go wrong. Now, Brandeis, a famous uh, US judge who was on the Supreme Court, wrote a book in 1914 in which he said, the goose that lays golden eggs has been considered a most valuable possession, but even more profitable is the privilege of taking the golden eggs laid by somebody else's goose. And the investment banks and their associates now enjoy that privilege. They control the people through the people's own money. And so he was already saying that the financial sector was where problems really come from. And this, of course, was before the Great Crash. And there was a nice picture of how Brandeis viewed these people. And what he was worried about was the concentration of so much wealth in the hands of so few bankers. And uh, he said, you know, he knew that the network of ownership at that time, and as you know now, people work a lot on networks, uh, it was very dense. And his book came out again in 33, after the Great Crash. So let me take, give you a quick example, financial market models. How do economists build financial market models? Well, they have the same basic building blocks. Agents in these models have a way of forecasting future prices, okay? They know, they think they know how the prices are going to evolve. Given that, they, that determines how much they want to buy or sell uh, at any point in time. Once they do that, that determines the new price of the assets, and so the process goes on. So the prices that they have now, uh, the, the new prices, will influence their forecast in the future. That makes them change their behavior, and on we go. This process just unfolds like that. But the question is, does that lead you to, quote, equilibrium prices, which reflect the true value of the assets? And, of course, the efficient markets hypothesis, which you've heard about, suggests that it does. And it's very simple. It says the efficient markets hypothesis all the relevant information you need to know about uh, the uh, assets you can buy is contained in the prices. You have no need to look elsewhere. And of course, that's a paradox which was pointed out many years ago by Grossman and Stiglitz, because if nobody looks at their own information, how does that information ever get into the public eye? And the basic argument came from the work of Bachelier. And what Bachelier said in his thesis in 1900 was, if everybody gets a piece of information, looks at this piece of information, and then decides on the basis of that what I'm going to buy or what I'm going to sell, and all that information arises independently, and they don't look at anybody else, then that market will, in fact, converge to an equilibrium. And that was called the random walk hypothesis. But unfortunately for Paul Bashley, he, the referee for his thesis said, when people interact with each other, they don't do so by acting independently on their own information. They tend to watch each other and to behave like sheep. And who was that? Henri Poincaré, the great mathematician. And so he said, the mathematics is very nice, but it won't work in the real world. And of course, that has been completely ignored, and the efficient markets hypothesis became the basis for financial economics until very recently. And in fact, uh, when um, Bob Schiller was given his Nobel Prize, and he was somebody who's always insisted that the efficient markets hypothesis does not work. He was given it with Eugene Farmer, who's always insisted that efficient markets do work. <laughs> so you can ask yourself why that was. And as uh, Mencken, who's cited by Paul Krugman, said, talking about the efficient uh, markets hypothesis, there's always an easy solution to every human problem, neat, plausible, and wrong. And these are the, so the people that, in uh, uh, Bachelier's view, were quietly, independently, without worrying about anybody else, thinking about optimizing their intertemporal problem. And you can see how they're completely uninfluenced by what's going on. So where does it go wrong? Remember Poincaré's warning. Individuals don't only look at their own information, they also observe the actions of others, and they infer information from what the others are doing. So, how are we doing? 10 minutes. 10 minutes. 10 minutes. 10? 10 minutes. OK. 
Caramba. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll accelerate. Okay. Very quick lessons from social insects. Why do I talk about social insects? Because I think they're more... Think of a spectrum. Think of people who are highly sophisticated, do all their calculations, and they optimize over time, and they also know how the economy works. That's one extreme. That's the uh, econo uh, economist's extreme. Think of the other, which is the ants. Ants are very simple guys. They have very simple rules. They follow them, and they don't think about how the whole world works. They just follow their own little rules. But collectively, they achieve a lot. And now the question is, where are we? Nearer the ants or nearer the homo economicus? And I have a feeling that we're kind of nearer the ants. But that's why I wanted to mention them very quickly. So they learn in an environment, limited local knowledge, and they produce quite sophisticated aggregate behavior. Now, with a bit of luck, I can show you this. I don't, oh, you can't see that probably. Um, these ants, in this little experiment here, come out of their nest and they have to go to f uh, find food. And there's a, uh, a food source at the other end there, two paths to it, equal length, which one will they choose? And the question is, well, you might say, over time, they're eventually going to choose uh, half and half, right? There they go. This is just a simulation, okay? So they look pretty much half and half, but gradually what happens? They all concentrate on one side. Now, why is that? That's exactly because of positive feedback. That is, when ants go along a trail and find food, they lay a trail. And that reinforces the attraction of that trail for the others. And gradually, they all choose one. So instead of splitting themselves nicely, they all track off on one direction. But you could say, oh, well, that's just because they're even paths. So we move to the next one where there are uneven paths. And we could look at the same story. And then we're going to say, well, which path should they choose, the short one or the long one? Obviously, it would be more efficient to choose the short path. And in this simulation, that's exactly what they do. So we say, there you are, you are. Ants, over the millions of years, have evolved to do the efficient, optimal thing. Now, those were just simulations. But Guy Terolaz in Toulouse ran exactly that experiment with real ants. Okay? And the Germans have a whole series of programs on optimal adaptation to your environment. Plants, how they adapt optimally, animals and so forth. And they were very interested in his experiments. So they said, could you run that experiment for us with real ants? And he said, of course, we'll do that. And so he ran the experiment. And this is what you see on the German television. <laughs> if you happen to look at this series of programs. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that guy, he's not optimizing anything. <laughs> and you see the ants all chose the short path. Great. Now let me tell you the truth. When the Germans turned up, he ran his experiment and they all went down the long path, the ants. And the Germans said, unmöglich, no, no. Now our program's all about optimal adaptation. We can't have these guys going off down the long path. That would be very inefficient. So Guy apologized and ran the experiment again, and they all went down the long path. And so they said, nein. And uh, they were packing up their television stuff to go home. And Guy felt very bad. They came all the way from Berlin to Toulouse. So he said, we'll run it a third time. Third time he ran it, and they went down the short path. And that's what you see in the film. Ants always choose the short path, and they are very efficient. <laughs> and of course, it's not true. And in uh, nature, and uh, just as in the economy, you have these random events which are inside. They come from inside. Once you get ants going down one path, they're going to reinforce on that. And that's, those are end endogenous shocks. Here's an example with humans. These guys stood in the middle of Times Square and looked up at the sky. After a while, there were 5,000 people looking up at the sky. Because if people are looking up at the sky, there must be something to see up there, right? <laughs> they infer from the actions of the others that there's something to see. And so that's the sort of idea that was behind Poincaré's criticism of efficient markets. And here's a nice example from the markets. I've got a stock here that could really excel, really excel, 
sell, sell, and they go mad. And this guy down here says, this is madness. I can't take it anymore. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. And off they go. <laughs> Bye. Bye. And then down here's the guy who says, I've got a stock here. And off it goes again. But the point is a little bit of informa information, badly interpreted, can change the whole way the market goes. Okay? So what we have to explain is sudden large movements without the arrival of an exogenous shock or piece of news. This was the German, uh, the Dow Jones, sorry, from 1980 to 1990. And it was climbing steadily and could be thought of as a random walk around a trend. And at each point, we put the news that there was, the exogenous, possible exogenous shocks. But then, boom, it did that. And there was no important news at the point where it changed. The only important news was that Boris Yeltsin, I no, never can remember whether he became president of uh, Russia or stopped being president. But anyway, nothing important happened, and it suddenly turned down. It was endogenous. It wasn't due to some shock from the outside. And what you can do is build a model of simple interacting agents. And we did that, but I don't have time to tell you about that. But I'll give you this thing anyway. So you can use the ANTS process. If you have people doing something which is successful, other guys will follow. And once that happens, the process will take off and will lead you into booms and busts. So people like ANTS do the same thing. We built those models. and. We never got convergence to an equilibrium price. Prices were always changing. And we looked at the distribution. And what happens when you have this interaction is the tails of the distribution of the changes in prices become much bigger. Uh, extreme events happen much more often. And then another simple example, which I can't tell you about, but Warren Buffett talked about what we call derivatives. Everybody knows what derivatives are? Derivatives are instruments where I have a series of assets, and instead of selling you a single asset, I package them up together and sell you a piece of the package. And that was said, well, that must diversify risk, therefore everybody will be better off. And so the idea was derivatives were going to remove the volatility in markets. But in fact, they diminish the information that people have. And, uh, whoops, sorry. So, what did Warren Buffett say? In my view, derivatives are financial weapons of mass destruction, carrying dangers that while now latent are potentially lethal. He said that in 2002, and you remember what happened in 2008, and what may just be about to happen again. And here's somebody down here who says, wow, I thought we were just buying a house. You see brokers, banks, securities, all balanced on this subprime mortgages. Sorry, so the information was there, we knew at that time what was going wrong. Mortgages were not being paid. As the price of houses turned down, mortgages were not being paid back. So the underlying instruments in these assets were going very, very bad. But people sold them on. And as long as somebody else will buy those instruments, the market will keep going. And that's exactly what happened. So although we knew that the prices were going down of houses, which were underlying these assets, that didn't affect the price. And you can see it got to silly points here. This was in Alabama. US sent a hair, nails, gifts, and mortgages. <laughs> so, so you could buy a mortgage in the local barber shop. And this, uh, this got completely out of hand. And I w again, I don't have time to tell you. But gradually, as these mortgages became worse and worse, suddenly the market catches on. Somebody starts to look. Instead of selling you this asset, Somebody says, ooh, I better look at what's underlying this. And once you look at that, you say, whoa, I don't want to buy that, thank you. And then the whole thing just collapses. Um, but there, we have articles on that. You can, you're very welcome to read those. Don't, that's noisy a bit. What I mean? Inequality. Two rapid remarks. How long? Two minutes? Eight minutes. Five. Five. Oh, that's good. You, I think you're... you're <laughs> I think your minutes are Latin American then. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're kind of flexible, right? <laughs> OK. I inequality is a problem which has worried a lot of people. And in this city, there's, of course, somebody who's very famous now, Thomas Piketty, who's talked about that. Uh, if I had a little bit of time, uh, I, do, I had one minute to tell you a story for Argentina, OK? 
I gave a course in Buenos Aires, and just before me, Thomas Piketty came and gave a talk about inequality. He became very famous, he was a sort of uh, rock star of inequality. And he gave his talk in English, and there was a little guy translating for everybody. And everybody imagined that the little guy was translating from Thomas Piketty's English into Spanish. But he was actually translating from Thomas Piketty's English into English. Yes. <laughs> because the poor Argentinian guys couldn't understand Thomas Piketty's French accent. <laughs> 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 but but uh, don't tell people that, right? Because uh, 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 Thomas is a friend and I don't want him to. Anyway, so... Um, what Adam Smith said, it doesn't matter how income is distributed because people can't spend more than a certain amount on the things they want. Therefore, it will always get trickled down to other people and uh, the initial distribution of income doesn't count. We know now, of course, that that's very wrong. And there's the book in question. Why did that resonate so much? Why did people get so upset? Because they saw inequality as becoming something which was... Un, uh, very unfair to them, and they were suffering from it. And you remember all these protests. But the interesting thing here is this thing which was done by um, Dan Ariely in the States. He questioned 5,000 people and said, what do you think is the distribution of wealth in the US? And he said, how much does the top 20% have? How much does the second 20% have? And so forth. Okay? And this is what people reckoned it was. They thought that the top 20% had 60% of the wealth. They thought that the second 20% had about uh, 10 to 15% of the wealth and so forth, down to the bottom poor guys who have almost nothing. So that's what they thought it was, okay? And remember, these guys are very, very indignant. This is, we are, they, he then asked them, what would you like it to be? And this is what they thought it should be, that the top 20% should have 30%, because after all, they were probably talented guys, they were doing things and so forth, but no more. So you see, that's what they would like it to be. And now the question is, what is it really? There it is. And you can see that even though there was all this publicity, all these protests, people had no idea of how unequal the uh, wealth distribution was. And so now you look at that and you see that the difference between what they thought it was and what it actually is, is as great as the difference between what they thought it was and what they would like it to be. So if people know so little about the current situation, how can we believe that people are like the people with rational expectations and so forth, people who understand what's going on? Oops, that's gone. Mark is incentive, last remarks. One minute. <laughs> I wasted one minute telling you about Tom and Piketty. Right? <laughs> but uh, one of the... Major arguments has always been that the economy is such that people, when they have the right incentives, will do the right thing and the economy will organise itself right. And one of the problems with incentives is that you often don't get the results you expect. Let me give you one example. I haven't got time to give you all the examples. But the fam most famous example is what's called the Cobra effect in New Delhi. In Delhi, when the Brits were there, they saw that there were too many of these cobras, which are animals, which can, uh, snakes, which can really, if they bite a child or an older person, can really be very harmful and can kill them. So they said, what we will do is to give the people the right incentive to get rid of these cobras. So we will pay a premium, a price, for any dead cobra that's brought in. So, of course, the Indians heard this, and what did they do? They bred cobras. So <laughs> They bred lots and lots of cobras, and they would come in to see the Brits, put the cobras down, and then the Brits said, my goodness me, we got that wrong, so cancel the premium. So all these guys said, oh my goodness, our cobras are worth nothing now, so they let them all go. <laughs> and there were far more cobras at the end than they were at the beginning. And the same thing happened with rats in Vietnam, and well, there are many other examples. But I claim that that sort of perverse effect of uh, incentives can in fact still be going on today. And if you think of the LIBOR scandal, think of all the banking scandals that we've had. The fines carry strong echo of LIBOR. No end in sight to a rotten culture. And uh, there is a no end in sight, unfortunately. Um, 
And here are all the fines that people were paid for the uh, manipulation of the forex market. And this goes on in all sorts of spheres. We think we're giving people the right incentives, how to act. But in fact, they're always trying to get around the uh, rules that you, you provide. And here's a guy who was found guilty in spoofing case where you, know, you put in trades to persuade people to follow you, and then you get out quickly. Um, the Volkswagen scandal. Even the, in ath athletics, we had the same thing. You know, if, there are enough, if there's enough money in the system, there will always be people who try to get round of it. So our incentives don't really persuade people to work well. So I claim that individuals will adapt to whatever rules that are in place, and uh, institutions and rules co-evolve. So you have to constantly be changing the rules in order to keep the system under control. You can't write down a set of rules and say, if you all follow that, we have gendarmes who will take care of you if you don't. And uh, this is the problem with the people like uh, the Austerians, as Krugman likes to call them. You know, if you settle that, set for a, a given policy, there will always be people who profit from it. So you have to be very flexible. And the other thing is that morality seems to have completely disappeared from the financial sector. As Martin Wolf said in the Financial Times, we do not, by and large, police doctors in, the way, in this way because we trust them. We need to better trust financiers in much the same way. They're pretty hopeful. But. So I want to show you one last thing, which is the insurance... That's minus one or...? <laughs> <laughs> the insurance contract for the Titanic. There was a time when markets actually were based on confidence in each other. Here is the insurance contract for the Titanic. Okay, there it is, typed like that, and you can see they wrote in bits like, "Oops, we forgot about the uh, the bit where you go from Southampton to Belfast." So we just write that in. That's the contract, the whole insurance contract for the uh, Titanic. And look at your credit card contract sometime. <laughs> it's pages long. Yeah. <laughs> and here's the contract. It's all based on trust. And here's the other part of it. Guys sign up. They say, I take 10% of the risk, I take 5% of the risk, and so forth. They all put their names down, and that's the end. That's it. That's all there was. But all the claims on Titanic were paid within 48 hours of the Titanic sinking. Overall conclusions. So at that time, trust seemed to work. How come it collapsed? Very interesting subject for anybody who wants to do a thesis sometime. OK. We've developed over two centuries increasingly sophisticated, less realistic models of the economy. Economists do not naturally self-organize into a socially satisfactory state. Economies are not basically in equilibrium. They're constantly evolving and spontaneously generate periodic crises. Economies are evolving, complex, adaptive systems which coordinate on outcomes which may be far from optimal. Such systems are much less predictable than our current economic models claim. Last words for Mervyn King, ex-governor of the Bank of England. The message from Hayek, unfortunately Hayek again, is that we should avoid the hubris of thinking that we understand how the economy works. Just as we should avoid the hubris of thinking that leaving markets to their own devices will lead to nirvana. <laughs> and for those who wish to know more, you can read this book. That's Joseph Schumpeter, but I gave the Schumpeter lectures, but it's by me. And the, um, anybody who wants that book, if they send me an email, I still have the proof, so I can send you a free copy. And as my granny said, things are worth what you pay for them. There's a newer book, Complexity in Economics, but I can't give you a copy of that because I don't have an electronic version. How long will it take before all this takes over? As Max Planck said, a new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents, but rather because its opponents eventually die, and a new generation grows up that's familiar with it. And very last thing, don't, let you, uh, don't start to think that because I gave you this talk, it means we should abandon economic modeling. We should just do it very differently. And there are tools around to do it, and we should try to do that. And as Buzz Brock said, a famous American economist, you want to keep an open mind, but you don't want to open it so far that your brain falls out. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Professor Kierman, for the good presentation. We're going to make some comments and try to bring some different things on complex economy. 
uh, our presentation, we will do a summary. We're gonna try to think what we can complement with the complexity theory with other heterodox uh, theory. Uh, we're gonna try to bring more uh, practical uh, things that are being done uh, through the uh, complex theory, uh, especially focusing on finance and finance regulations. Mm -hmm. And then we're gonna throw some conclusions. Uh, so well, uh, as a brief recount, uh, focusing on some uh, elements because I, I think they have already been mentioned uh, before in a very deep way. Uh, well, mainstream models uh, are not realistic. We have seen this in the case of the financial crisis. Um, models do not, uh, or markets do not uh, convert to a steady state. They are not self-equilibrating uh, because the economy is a complex uh, and adaptive system. Uh, this is in line with an organic approach uh, of the economy uh, that sees the whole as different uh, to the sum of the parts. Um, this is in line with uh, the idea that uh, agents are not optimizers. Uh, they are uh, following certain rules and when they don't achieve a certain threshold, they taint them. Um, and uh, their behavior is not rational but purposeful. Um, the information that they have is local and limited, and their main problem is not uh, efficiency in economics, but the problem of coordination uh, between agents. The policy recommendation that follows from this in, is that uh, the, it is not possible to forecast, uh, it is only possible to try to detect some patterns in people's behavior, and from them uh, try to uh, react to this behavior uh, and develop um, co-evolutionary co policies. Um, this idea uh, is related to um, a concept that has been very developed by uh, all heterodox economic schools of thought, that is that time matters. Uh, John Robinson in 1980s uh, differentiated between the logical time that permeates uh, mainstream models uh, from the historical time um, that takes into account irreversibility of economic processes, uh, path dependencies, uh, the fact that the past behavior influences on, on the present, uh, this idea of feedback effects which can lead to increasing uh, returns to scale, cascading effects, um, and uh, this uh, can be, has been very developed by the evolutionary school of thought, uh, the idea that um, there is learning. Uh, time leads to learning and, and uh, leads to um, the development of cognitive frameworks. Uh, these cognitive frameworks are, or this learning is an open-ended process, provisionally uh, and potentially fallible, uh, which means that it is not linear, there might be mistakes, uh, sometimes it is cumulative, but in other cases it involves destruction of knowledge uh, and construction of a new one, as the case of for example, Schumpeter that talk about the creative destruction. Um, and uh, this knowledge uh, is different from information, uh, which is usually in the mainstream models, uh, because um, not always it is uh, codified. Many times it is tacit. It depends on uh, learning by doing processes. Um, it is highly dependent uh, on the context. Um, it is embedded in social structures, which makes them not easily uh, transmissible. And many times this knowledge uh, leads to the development of uh, routines, which enable to organize the complexity uh, of the economy uh, and release energies for uh, innovation, creative, uh, creative activities. Um, and they are usually not changed unless a satisfactory level is not achieved. So in this sense, agents are not optimizers. And um, this is related to the idea with that people are not always pursuing their self-interest. Uh, this has been uh, very developed and there are very interesting contributions by feminist economics. Uh, we tell you that there are other motivations, um, such as uh, affection, uh, altruism, uh, compulsion to social norms, in this regard, they emphasize that um, actions are relational uh, and that it's important to take into account path interdependencies. 
In this sense, networks matter, uh, and uh, these interactions uh, shape the environment, and the environment also shapes uh, how this, these interactions take place. Um, but I think it would be interesting, uh, and mainly may from institutionalized economics, to that uh, complexity economics take uh, more into account uh, the power relationships in networks because uh, they are not so emphasized. Um, and uh, it happens that in networks, not all parts are equally important or equally influential. Um, this results this might result sometimes in that the, the outcome uh, might be negative for the collective well-being, but they are reproduced because they generate the conditions by which certain groups uh, benefit and can influence on the reproduction. Uh, so this is um, related to the conflicts between uh, different social groups regarding uh, distribution, regarding uh, the, the conditions, uh, and regarding the influence of these uh, networks. Um, which is related to a very important point, which is the heterogeneity of agents. Now, Tiago is going to talk uh, about a specific example of complexity economics regarding financial markets. So, uh, your, your paper described really well the theoretical uh, background and discussion on the um, uh, complexity theory. So, we wanted to bring like how complexity theory is being uh, done and it's improving uh, the models in economic and public policies. And we are due to the time that we have, we're going to focus more on financial sector and uh, financial policy. So first thing is that, uh, as you mentioned in the paper, we have to understand that the, uh, there is this uh, systemic risk with the, once there is like interaction changes uh, institutions, uh, as we also saw in Goodman's class a lot. Uh, so, if one, uh, one, uh, if something happens with one individual, can have like this effect in the, in the rest of the system. Uh, so, we really need to have a complete map of the network if you want to do some regulation or uh, policy in the financial sector. And uh, as you mentioned, like uh, why this complete network is not uh, introduced on the macroeconomic models is uh, once they don't. Uh, they cannot be done with the equilibrium uh, theory, so they are not being included. Uh, so uh, you mentioned that we we have to choose of or uh, changing the models that we have or introducing uh, different uh, imperfections, or we should uh, create new models. And I'm gonna just mention a couple of models that are being used in the complexity theory. I cannot like explain all, but. There is being using agents based model, as you mentioned, also nonlinear models that are actually are good for out of sample forecasting. Also, uh, behavioral models that are good uh, mechanisms for managing uh, social contagion. And we're going to focus on the last one, which is network model that is possibly especially important for uh, seeing systemic risk. So, we we got a study uh, from uh, Batiston uh, in the Dutch Interbank uh, network, and he compared uh, two different models, one uh, based on the, uh, that are most used in, uh, for economics in the mainstream, which uh, they just uh, put on their models the uh, homogeneous uh, banking system. So there is the core and periphery banks, so there is the big banks and the small banks and the they have this connection, and the other, the other one with the red uh, line, uh, they they uh, took into account a heterogeneous uh, banking system with banking rela uh, relation with more than just uh, dyads, but triads with different type of system, and and you can see that uh, w once you do this, you could uh, have have pre forecast that. In 2005, uh, the networks were already starting to uh, be misleading. Uh, so uh, one thing that we can already uh, see as a policy is that uh, you cannot just, uh, as a public institution, just look to one bank or to the balance sheet and assets or liabilities of a bank, but you have to see the connections 
in order if we want to do any efficient policy. So also in the in the study, they 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 saw that the most uh, network uh, arrangement that uh, started to fall in 2005 was this type of arrangement. With, with it's because when you you look into uh, networks and there's uh, in that triad way, which you you, con you uh, there is a connection between uh, one bank with other two banks, and this was which they, he calls unreciprocated tree loop. So there's one bank relating with the other, which is relating to the third one, which have the relation with the first one. You, don't, you cannot uh, measure the risk premium because you don't know uh, that the, the third one also have the same risk that you, you're providing. And it, this is uh, especially important to, uh, to analyze uh, over-the-counter uh, transactions. So you have to uh for for a uh, good diagnosis you have to have this complete network analysis uh and looking to the paper this was one thing that i uh think well, it's important to to talk the f the what the complexity theory are saying that uh, should be the uh, applied policies and so this uh, decentralizing political uh, decision, uh, uh, influencing, uh, incentivating uh, collective satisf satisfactory outcomes, and also the whole uh, the of the economy is more as a passive, uh, as an observer, uh, reacting after the events have come. And this I would like, uh, if you could talk uh, more on that, because I think maybe the economists can have a bigger role or can act more active in the economy. So if you could uh, explain more, what should the economists, what should be the role of the economists in the, in the system that we have? So. Well, uh, as a general reflection to our comments, uh, we would like to pose uh, that maybe uh, if complexity economics models would have uh, been listened, the financial crisis of 2008 would have been uh, forecasted before. Uh, this shows the limitations of uh, mainstream models. Um, it seems that public policies, in a way, in some circumstances, are pragmatically acknowledging this. For example, the case of uh, central banks, uh, when systemic risk is uh, being taken into account, um, uh, in the policies that are developed, uh, but can we say that uh, we are facing a paradigmatic shift uh, in terms of uh, the theories or the models that uh, we are taking into account? Well, even it's not possible to say that this, but at least there is a fertile ground uh, to raise some points. Uh, and uh, that these points at least to be listened, such as the economy is complex, historically conditioned, dependent on power relationships and conflicts between social groups, uh, and that agents are heterogeneous and differently motivated. And the fact that there are many commonalities uh, regarding some concepts, regarding some metaphysical uh, presumptions between heterodox economic schools, uh, give it more power to this uh, possible change. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, if you would like to make some comments to our comments, or if not, we open the floor as you prefer. Yeah, I make just a couple of very quick comments. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for the, uh, um, your remarks. Um, and, ah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but when, what happens when all these four guys want to talk? <laughs> Okay. Do you want to do it? Yeah, okay. Do you want me to move back? I'm taking my coffee around, which is getting colder and colder. Um, okay, so just let me say a couple of things. Um, I think all the points you make are quite right. Um, and this idea that if we take... By the way, one thing. Could we stop talking about heterodox and orthodox? You know, orthodox, uh, for me, means the guys with the hair like this, you know, big black hats. <laughs> and, you know, 
economics is not a religion. It's, um, actually, it should be just about trying to understand economic phenomena. And we shouldn't be dividing people up into camps. And <laughs> so, but, um, and so, you know, I, it just depends on when people knew me. If they, people who know me a long time ago, say that he's very orthodox, right? Because I mean, he did general equilibrium theory and all that stuff. And he's obviously a mathematical economist. And other people who know me recently say the guy's completely weird. He's <laughs> obviously heterodox. Um, but anyway, I think we should just drop that. But uh, your point about power relationships in graphs is very important. Because that's what the one thing that Adam Smith did not see. He said, you know, it doesn't really matter who, how income's distributed because you can only spend so much. So the rest will sort of trickle down to the others. But what we know now is that uh, wealth and uh, high income buys power. You can influence people. You can, um, people start to depend on you. And uh, so what they do, how they vote and so forth, is very dependent on the amount of money that's put in. That's why uh, the system has changed so much, because we have huge lobbies with very powerful people in them who have an influence on others. And we should take into account that when we draw a simple network. It, it isn't a network between people of equal standing. Some people have a lot more influence in that network than others. Um, one last remark about, um, you know, does this stuff ever get into real economic policy considerations? At the OECD, we have a group which is called Nike, not from the running shoes, huh? um, although I, I want to keep the motto, let's just do it. But, um, <laughs> Um, Nike is New Approaches to Economic Challenges and there's a whole series of seminars and a whole series of programs based on that and uh, I'm part of that group and so I t suggest to you that you look at the OECD's uh, website and have a look at Nike and you will see that despite the fact that many people are somewhat reticent many of the remarks that you made here and many of the remarks I made are getting through you know that um, a lot of people who take the decisions actually are listening to this and they're worried about complexity and so forth. And if anybody wants to send me a thing, I can send you a few um, references. Uh, there's a, a little book that was produced in that context about uh, alternative approaches to economics and so forth. So I don't think it's completely academic. I think that it has actually penetrated the scene. And the OECD is not the most sort of uh, revolutionary and you know, so you, you won't see people with red flags in front of the OECD, but it is actually influencing them. And uh, are we facing a paradigm change or not? That's maybe just a question of semantics. Thomas Kuhn uh, suggested what he thought was a paradigm shift, but um, we could think about whether we're actually going through a real change, and I think we should be. But all we can say, can we just fix it? If, as a last remark, Ptolemy, his theory about pl planetary movements dominated the world until Copernicus ca came along. But did it happen that when Copernicus arrived and explained that he believed it, it wasn't actually the uh, planets that uh, turned around the Earth but around the, the, in the solar system, when he came around, did everybody say, oh, right, that's good, we'll throw all the others? Not at all. Over nearly 200 years, the Ptolemaeans struggled to fit the Ptolemaean model to the way planets move. And they had very complicated things with um, basically circular orbits, but they modified them slightly. So this is exactly like what we're going through now, but we don't have a couple of hundred years to do it. So I think we are going through a paradigm change, but it's going to be very difficult. Most people want to cling on to um, the old ways that the, the people have learned in economics. And uh, you remember, you may remember, how many of you actually did more than one course in microeconomics. Okay. You remember that you started out with nice diagrams and then you moved to uh, analysis and then you moved to um, beyond differential calculus to more, more difficult things. But at some point, you had maximization and you had Lagrangian multipliers. Do you remember Lagrangian multipliers? Right? And Werner Hildenbrand, my co-author, who was a general equilibrium specialist, said, I think the only way for economics to make progress is to ban Lagrangian multipliers for two years. And uh, that's probably true, because people think all the time about constrained maximization, as if that's what the individuals are doing. And they're not doing that. And remember what Pareto said, 
and Pareto after all is the father of mathematical economics, he said, I think people spend some of their time taking non-rational decisions and the rest of, the rest of their time rationalizing them. And I think that's exactly what's going on. So thank you for your comments. And uh, I'd be very happy to exchange emails with you if you want to pursue this. Yeah. And it's yeah. up to you guys now. You can all protest. <laughs> well, uh, who wants to make some question? Um, thank you very much for your presentation and for you for the discussion and for the comments. I'm, my name is Julian. I'm from Argentina, option B, which is like macroeconomy finance. I didn't forget this time. Um, so uh, you said economics is not a religion. <laughs> um, might I disagree? <laughs> I mean... No, I, 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 I'm wrong. I should say it shouldn't be. Ah, okay. <laughs> then my point... I mean, you have made my point, so I move to the second <laughs> question. Um, you mentioned, okay, so this is the framework of complexity, and you have mentioned uh, that this is like slowly permeating, the, for example, in the OECD. Mm -hmm. I mean, not in the theory, but at least in the policy service. Right. Uh, for instance, uh, Bill White from the OECD came to give a seminar here right. a like a month ago. Clara and me were like the discussants. And what was really striking for me is that Complexity by itself and these new methods, as you pointed out, uh, they can actually be supported by any political ideology. And this is shown by the strong influence of Hayek in all this complexity literature. As you mentioned, many of these people are actually embracing complexity, but from a Hayekian point of view, and will ultimately lead to support the same political conclusions that we derive from neoclassical models. So I want to know what are your thoughts on this. Yeah, and, uh, you, you noticed that I mentioned Hayek twice. Um, last year we had um, with uh, Sam Bowles and Rajiv Sethi an article on Hayek in the Journal of Economic Perspectives. And Hayek is sort of schizophrenic because on the one hand he gets to the heart of the problem which is that information is widely distributed, individuals don't have all the information. Somehow this system manages to get that information together. And he believed that markets would, in fact, translate that information so that the things worked efficiently. And he claimed that it was only because governments interfere with that 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 didn't happen. But that's a leap of faith. He never showed that there was a process that would actually make that, uh, make that happen. And Hayek was a very smart guy, a horrid guy, but um, he was racist, and, uh, but you may not know that. But if you go on YouTube and look for Hayek, you can find an interview with Hayek where somebody said, um, uh, but uh, we, we've heard that you are somewhat racist. He said, I am not racist at all. I have no prejudice against any group, except that at the LSE we have these Indian students who probably have as far as fat Hindu moneylenders who, uh, and he went on and on like this. <laughs> However, However, I am not racist in any way. <laughs> <laughs> and these people have not the same criteria as us. <laughs> but you can hear this. I mean, this is just absolutely astonishing. But anyway, uh, Hayek, no, Hayek had brilliant ideas. And in 38, for example, he had a, an article in which he anticipated rational expectations. But he still fell into the same trap of believing that, in the end, this system, even though he dismissed Valrasian auctioneers and so forth, would in fact stabilize itself and self-organize itself. He believed that I mean, he was stro so strongly against any form of totalitarianism, and given his background, you could understand why, but uh, uh, that he, this blinded him to the fact that analytically we couldn't show what he claimed was true. So I th that's the problem, that uh, we, 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 this step from this system is self-organizing, statement to proving that, it's state, uh, that it is self-organizing and stable uh, is just a step we never have been able to make. Is that an answer to your question, more or less? More. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for this uh, presentation. Um, I'm Carmen, also from Option B, Macro and Finance, and from Germany. So I enjoyed the aunts. Um, <laughs> I have. <laughs> yeah, you understood what they were saying, right? Yeah, yeah, I understood. 
um, <laughs> um, I have two somewhat related questions. Um, one uh, evolves around incentives. Um, so one major problem uh, taking rats in Vietnam or cobras in New Delhi um, is potentially uh, that uh, if there's no limit set to how, how to how many rats or cobras they can um, ha hand in for receiving like this funding, then uh, obviously this this will be the way around. The question is, can an incentive? Oh, my question is, can an incentive ever be set correctly, or what would have happened if we if we had said, okay, you can give us five rats a month or so? Um, and then uh, the question is also, what's the in somewhat, um, it's such a prevalent uh, scheme to think that uh, incentives do the trick. What's the alternative? Uh, a system back based on trust as the Titanic contract, or is it the, um, the better coordination of, of complex processes? And that's where my second question goes. Um, it is, you have various times stressed that um, coordination is the main um, uh, concern of, of complexity economics. So is efficiency a sort of side effect as soon as um, processes are well coordinated? And what happens with um, agents that pursue very different goals and have conflicting claims? Is it possible to uh, coordinate a system to make them sur bypass each other rather than conf confront uh, and conflict? Well, of course, the, your first question addresses the issue that people like um, Eric Maskin and others worked on an enormous amount. Can we develop mechanisms which are incentive compatible? Can we in fact produce mechanisms so that people, given those incentives, will have uh, the, the right behavior? And the question is, that has always been very difficult in practice to do. But um, uh, in fact, in these auctions, for example, we know that the famous uh, wave band auctions for the uh, uh, telephones in the US, that that went uh, badly wrong because people worked out how to cheat, right? But um, so that's always a problem. Um, and I think that the uh, question is, can we get the right uh, thing? You said, well, maybe we should ration people. But then, of course, Hayek was saying, nothing because of, what are you doing rationing people? Then that stops it being free. But I think the answer is that um, my, uh, my suggestion would be that what we need to have is measures which, if we see that there's a, 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 a bad reaction, a perverse reaction, we correct what we gave as an incentive. We're constantly looking at, watching, and changing. And that's what you see uh, happening in, in markets all the time. Whenever something, somebody works out a clever trick for uh, cornering the market, for example, as the Hunt brothers did with the silver market, then you have to put in place some sort of uh, incentives to stop them doing that. And you're constantly evolving with the rules. So you can never set down what you call a correct measure. So I think that the problem with the incentive compatible literature is that you have the idea that once you've done it, given the information people have, it will uh, work out. But you can never be sure that people won't find some way around it. So you have to constantly, and I think that's the, the, the yeah, and the thing at the OECD that makes people upset is that when you say to them, now people have to have policies which are constantly adapting to what's going on. And that's bad for politician because the politician wants to say, I have this strategy and that's what I'm going to stick to. And that's exactly what happened with austerity. If you've been preaching austerity, people are out of work and so forth because of it, how can you turn around and say, sorry guys, I made a mistake there. Um, <laughs> yeah, that wasn't what we wanted to do. And you know, that's very, very difficult. For, and we have these long discussions at UEC exactly about that. The fact that politicians want to have, need to have a clear platform. And people who don't uh, are difficult to elect. A, a perfect example is Janet Yellen. Janet Yellen was n disliked intensely by many people because she never said, we're going to do this and we'll tell you when and this is what's going to happen. We said, she would always say, let's see how the economy evolves. Let's see what's going on. And then they would say, no, but tell us what's going to happen. <laughs> no, I can't. And so, but I think she had exactly the right attitude. And of course, um, Mr. Trump got rid of her. But um, the second part of your question was? Uh, it was on um, coordination, whether efficiency is a side effect of yeah. coordination and what to do with conflicting claims. 
Yeah, okay. Now, the, it's a very interesting property of complex systems, which people like Jean-Philippe Bouchot, who's a well-known statistical physicist in Paris, but also owns a hedge fund, and also owns a theatre, by the way. Um, <laughs> very interesting guy, very nice guy. But anyway, what Jean-Philippe and some of his colleagues have shown is that with a complex system, if you try to optimise the um, behaviour of the parts, you actually make the system more fragile. That trying to squeeze the maximum efficiency out of the components can make the system extremely unstable. And so that's a lesson that we should think about because, you know, you have supply chains where you want to get it right to the very limit. You just push so that exactly the right amount's going through it and so forth. A small uh, perturbation to that system can lead to major consequences. So what you actually want are systems which are more resilient, maybe not quite as efficient in the absolute sense, but systems which survive have a certain amount of flexibility in them. And uh, so this is a, a problem for economists who have always worked on being at the efficient frontier. In, s in many cases, you don't want to be right at the efficient frontier. You, you don't want to do things which are stupid, but you don't want also to squeeze, turn the, th the system. I can give you one very quick example. Um, there's a man called Dirk Helbing in uh, Zurich who's written a lot about um, uh, the applications of information technology to the economy. But he had as a task with a group to improve the flow of uh, pilgrims at, at Mecca. And they have to go through and uh, have to get to the Hajj, go around the Hajj, and then go on, right? So uh, on several occasions, hundreds of people have been killed because of too much uh, crowding and people getting crushed and so forth. So they designed a system. They even changed the nature of the Hajj so that it was no longer round. It was uh, kind of elliptical, so people flowed around it better. And it worked much better. There were very few accidents afterwards until, I think it was 2015, when there was a terrible thing in which 2,500 people, the Saudis have never admitted exactly how many, but I think 2,500 people kill, were killed. Why was that? Because the Saudi family, royal family, had visitors, which they considered were important, so they blocked off two of the exits to the system of the Hajj. And all of a sudden, of course, this caused a disaster. But that system was working better, was more efficient, but it was more fragile. And so the lesson from this is that you try to get everything working perfectly. If it is working perfectly, it's fine. But if you have a, a perturbation to the system, a change in the system, it can become very fragile. So uh, I think that's the point about efficiency is not almost a side effect. In fact, it's something sometimes you don't want to go for too much. Okay? Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Uh, hello, my name is Mariam, and uh, I'm from Option C, which is a more development path of Ebog. Uh, I'm from Egypt. And You're from um, India? Egypt. Egypt, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so um, you have mentioned that uh, it is probably quite impossible to have uh, universal laws in economics mm -hmm. uh, because it's the nature of, of the science, of the social sciences, and uh, we, we are more able to perhaps um, um, observe patterns. But uh, I, I totally agree. I mean, we cannot have universal laws which are constant in time and space. It does not exist. But if, um, I mean, if we just accept that we have only patterns and then we have to um, to be able to act uh, based on our information and our uh, observance, then, I mean, how uh, it just seems to me that economics will end up being um, an exposed science. So we, we can only react, but we cannot, uh, we cannot decide how is it going to be in the future, which is also perhaps because of all the technological advancement that we, as, eco as, as economists, but, but also politicians, we, we don't have enough experience uh, on how things can, can go. I mean, we, we do not decide, we do not make ourselves the software that, uh, for example, control how the stock markets were reacting in case of a crisis, which, which is one of, like, one of the things that are not actually in our hands. Uh, we can call exogenous, but <laughs> I don't want to talk about exogenous again. <laughs> no, no. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's very d what you say is very difficult 
um, to answer in a sense because what we have is a world which is changing very fast and uh, even the nature of work, even the nature of um, how the, the stock market actually works. You know, if you get down to the nitty gritty of how uh, and the economy really works, how the financial sector really works, and look at all the pieces together and how they interact, and with the introduction of high-speed trading and so forth, how those algorithms affect the, the way the economy works. Uh, I don't think we're going to progress towards um, getting uh, an understanding where we have a complete model, and so we say, oh, well, we should just change that. What, what we do notice is that um, we have to put uh, thresholds um, and uh, various sort of breaks, if you like, in the system in order to stop it running away. Because just think of a very, very simple example. You, what people do is program their trading uh, bots, if you want to call them that, to sell at a, when the stock gets to a certain level. So you say to the guy who's programming it, right, OK, what we want to do is put in the stop loss um, things. Okay, everybody said, right, okay, we'll do that. And the little guy who's doing that doesn't think much about exactly what values he should take. So he will put in at 100, 150, or whatever. If it falls to 150, then we should sell. Falls to 100, we should sell, and so forth. But all those little guys are quite like each other. They're not going to choose 117 or something like that. So if they all choose 100, that's really bad because all of a sudden the thing gets to 100 and boom, everybody sells and we're down to 75 and then boom, everybody sells again. And that's something that uh, without any noise in there, uh, the system becomes fragile again because we thought that we were really getting it nicely organized. Uh, so we have to take care of that, the fact that uh, you know, co that's bad coordination in some sense. Everybody starts to behave like everybody else. And but I think that, uh, yeah, it's also the idea that with all this data we have now, we must be able to do better, right? Not so obvious. Right? It uh, could be that that makes life more difficult and not uh, easy to sort out. In the end, there's one of those at the end, right? So you get all this information and you say, wow, there's much too much for me to handle. So I'm going to have this algorithm which sort of sorts out the information that's important for me. But the algorithm is developed by somebody. And it has to choose. It has to choose which information to filter. And that in itself is going to make the system more complicated. So I think we're moving into a world that's more difficult. But I don't think uh, our models are going to be, in some sense, better at actually predicting what's going to happen. I think we're just going to have to react to things as they happen. And that doesn't sound good, right? But it's a bit like dentists, you know? The dentist doesn't worry about the fundamental reasons that you have toothache. He just tries to you know, cure your teeth. Keynes once said, I think that's how economists, that would be the ideal. That economists become like dentists. They come in, they fix a problem, and then you call them when you need them. And we, we're probably never going to be like that. But we have to be the sort of people who have a very pragmatic, I think, attitude to, and very modest attitude to what we can actually say or do. But, but that, sorry, but that doesn't make it, no. <laughs> Which part it's of Egypt do you come from? Huh? Which part of Egypt do you Cairo. come from? Cairo. Cairo, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I mean, f well, f yeah, I mean, that's a bit depressive for our roles as economists, but um, um, if it's only so, then, and we know for sure that by time, actually, people behavior cha changes, so... Anyway, we can only understand it after some time, after, after the, the, the behavior takes place over time. So, we are, we, I mean, in fact, we are, we are unable to, to put, uh, we just put limit of 100, for example, on the, the, the stock market price or the, like a, the threshold, but then um, we only knew it because of what happened before, but that doesn't mean that 100 now will, will prevent a crisis in the future. No, no, no. I need, um, but if we, we could add just some noise into the system, right? Say in, when this guy, when he gets to 100, uh, will actually not execute all these trades at once and so forth. But uh, you're, you're absolutely right that uh, putting these fixed thresholds in there, uh, you know very well that in the US there was a system for checking taxes. And the system said, you know, if, you, if your income went up by more than 
some percentage, then we're going to run a check on you. So we run checks on people who have a big change in their income. But there were guys who worked for the Inland Revenue, in the Internal Revenue in the uh, US, who developed those thresholds and then set up in business telling people. So they would say, make sure your income doesn't go up by more than 20%, otherwise you're going to get checked. And so as soon as you put in a threshold like that, there's somebody clever around who's going to uh, work out how to do it. But you also, the other thing you said is right, that how do we get on in a system which is changing when we have to learn from experience? But if the experience, if things are changing all the time, is our experience the, the right um, thing to use? And the insurance companies now are very worried about that. In the, a big report in, the, in 2015 by the Geneva Association of Insurers, they said, we have to get used to the fact that we used to calculate premiums on the basis of previous experience. Now, we have to get used to the fact that we're going to have to take other things into account. The future will not be like the past, and calculating things on the past will lead us into a disastrous situation. So, you know, it, it's, in some sense, it's not hopeful for being a scientist, you know. But on the other hand, it may make us better pragmatic economists. And I think we need more people who understand what really happens at the level of the economy in all the different sectors, from finance to fish markets, which I used to, but everything. So I think we need more people who understand economic phenomena and fewer people who spend a lot of time building very sophisticated models. Thank you very much for being here today. Um, my name is Ryan, I'm from Ireland, and I'm also in option B, the macroeconomic. You're from Ireland. Ireland? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm also from the macroeconomic and finance option. Um, so I have two questions, I think. The first, uh, yeah, if I can remember them. The first one... Um, Only two, and you can't remember them? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's worrying, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's the well, end of the semester. There's <laughs> far too much going on in my brain. Um, the first uh, concerns what you, um, when, uh, what you stressed regarding uh, trust in the economy and I completely agree that there is this difference uh, over time there used to be more trust in the economy in some sense there's been some marketization of social aspects of the economy and that has been to the detriment um, on occasion for people um, but my question then is is the genie out of the bottle in the sense of can we restore trust can we bring trust back into the economy um, restore that function that it, that it played um, and if so, how? How can we do that? So the first one is about trust. The second one um, concerns perhaps the f throwaway comments that you made, but um, the one about orthodoxy and um, heterodoxy. <laughs> so, I mean, maybe from a marketing point of view, stressing the difference between orthodox and heterodox is not always wise, especially when you're applying for a job or trying to have some impact or whatever it may be. But in a practical sense, is it not useful especially if we're thinking of how we teach economics, to, not, uh, to, to maintain the belief and kind of push for the belief that um, we are better served when we have knowledge, not just of what is going on in the mainstream, but also of um, yeah, theories based on radically different assumptions, which you know, contrasted then provide for the fuller toolkit. You know? So yeah, my question, I guess, uh, the second question regards how to teach economics. Um, okay, um, yeah, pluralism and so on. Okay, let's start with trust. Um, you're absolutely right that it's very difficult, and you know this from relationships. Somebody can do something which causes you to lose confidence in him, and that's much faster than building up confidence in him. And that's one of the major problems that trust is a thing which is built up over a, a long time. And there's a lot of literature on trust in economics, and uh, let's show on the Genoe uh, uh, Genovese traders, and there the idea was people of, uh, had the same religious identity would trust each other. They would somehow feel that they, that community, it was not reasonable to cheat your other members of that community. So trust can be based on many, many things, based on family, on religion. Um, there's, uh, there's some very nice articles on the Renaissance uh, Florence, and how the families there, the family links in the markets, were very important in those markets. So how do you re-establish trust once it breaks down? That's extremely difficult to say. 
Ellen Armstrong would have said, probably at a local basis, that is, people have to start acting much more locally. The fact that we're globalizing everything may in fact make it very difficult to have trust. In th and the idea that you can sort of mechanically install trust by saying, well, we know that the system is absolutely reliable and so forth. It's all been wired up so you can have perfect confidence in this system. I don't think that really works. You, you may have heard of the story of the first plane that took off from London to go to New York was fully automated. And there were no uh, cr crew on board except for the hostesses. And when it had taken off, it, the announcement came up and said, this is welcome aboard the very first fully automated no crew plane from London to New York. Everything has been checked, don't worry about anything. Everything has been double checked and we have all the fallbacks and uh, safety measures necessary. So nothing can go wrong, can go wrong, can go wrong, can go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so you imagine you're up in the air. <laughs> so I think restoring trust mechanically is a very difficult problem, but it's, it, I think it will be important in the future that we uh, manage to reintroduce some of that. And, uh, and the, some of the way the system is evolving is actually undermining that. If you go to your bank, you'll find that the guy you talk to is no longer the same. They're changing him all the time. They think that that's better. But for many people, it's actually important to have a person who you relate to, who you can talk to, who knows you, who knows your background and so forth. So I think that's the first question. The second question was? Ah, right. Well, they, that's a, a thing I have a fight with every summer with um, Wendy Carlin and her group have produced a thing called Core Economics Curriculum. And I think that she's not revolutionary enough. She's, but I told her, I think, Wendy, you, the problem is you're trying to teach the wrong stuff in the right way. <laughs> and, <I think> that, <laughs> and what you should do in the long run is try and teach better stuff in the right way. But I told her, I think that in the end, her enterprise will work because it shows you all the weaknesses in the economics. Instead of being taught that this is sort of the holy grail, you're told from the start by people like Sam Bowles and company where the difficulties are. And any good young student will say, wait a minute, <laughs> with all these difficulties, are we really sure that this is exactly what we want to learn? So in some sense, in a perverse way, by still sticking pretty much to the basic material but teaching it better, you make it evident to students that they should really be thinking about this and not just take it as some sort of technical apparatus which they can then use. So um, how you should teach it. If you try to say to UCL and the other people, the LSE, the people that have adopted this program, you know, we should actually have start out with interactions between people, we start out with networks and so forth. They say, no way we could do that. No, you have to have micro, macro and so forth. But in some sense, insidiously, this may be the way to undermine that. Hi, um, I'm Benedict. I'm from Germany. I'm also in the macroeconomic kind of branch of this thing. Uh, I have a kind of question wh where I want to try to think about practical things. Uh, and that is, we all know uh, here in this room at least, where the problems are, and that maybe it's for us to change it as you know, young economists. But how are we going to do this in terms of uh, careers that we have to build? Because uh. I, I guess the most the most practical approach to building a career is to do the most impractic impractical model and get it published somewhere and uh, continue on that path. Yeah. So where where do you see levy? Where do you see entry points where people that want to be practical economists can actually survive and make a living? Mm -hmm. Well, I could suggest you to apply to the Young Professionals Program at the um, OECD, for example. Uh, we're sort of fighting the good fight to try and get people who don't come from necessarily uh, very orthodox uh, training to get hired. And so that's the sort of place that it's starting. But you're absolutely right. If you want to get into a good university, what you want to do is publish in the right journals. And the right journals are edited by people whose human capital is based on 
the sort of standard thinking. So that makes it very difficult for somebody who comes in from the, the outside. But uh, it depends on how courageous you are, um, in some sense. Uh, I think it was George Bernard Shaw who said that the uh, reasonable man tries to adapt himself to the way the world is. The unreasonable man tries to adapt the world to the way he thinks it should be. And therefore, all progress is due to unreasonable men. And uh, so uh, I think in some sense one has to be a bit unreasonable. But there are many, many now, I think, opportunities around for people who are interested in uh, different aspects. of. For example, supposing you went into agent-based modeling. Uh, a number of universities now have quite big programs where they build agent-based models, particularly macro models these days. Um, and uh, I can tell you the names of groups where they do that, and at good universities. So, but this is still a minority, so you have to have more courage. If you want to be absolutely sure of getting a, a boring job at a good university, then try and publish in one of the top five journals. And uh, once you've done that, then it'll be okay. I once, many, many years ago, wrote an article called Whom or What Does the Representative Individual Represent? And I got up. Th that's a, one of the articles I think I wrote that I had more citations than any other article. And I got a letter from a young guy at UCLA who said, uh, Dear Professor Kerman, I really agree with everything you said. Intellectually, I can't see any reason to disagree with you. However, he said, I'm an uh, assistant professor and I haven't got tenure yet. And I want to get tenure. And the way I can get tenure is to continue to build representative agent models because I know how to do that and I know how to get them published. He said, then when I've got tenure, I can think about the things you've been saying. <laughs> Unfortunately, he said, I, I know myself. <coughs> and by the time I've got to that stage, I will find it much easier to continue building representative agent models and publishing them than it would be to change the way I think about it. And I've followed his career, and he still builds representative agent <laughs> models <laughs> and still publishes. But I thought, what an honest guy. You know, <laughs> you know he was absolutely reasonable. And, uh, and that's the way it goes. It's, it is difficult, but people are, are changing it. And for example, networks uh, were not, in fact, in any way thought of as being very serious in economics. And now a lot of people do. But the problem is that networks are still thought of as being an interesting area which we should get into and uh, really gives us interesting insights. But it, they don't affect the basic macroeconomic models, right? You don't get much n network stuff in there. Asimoglu has done a bit, but in the end, the networks are used usually to explain big um, shocks to the system and so forth. They're not used as a sort of basic way of looking at the economy. There's only one textbook that I know which actually starts out with individuals not as isolated individuals, but in a network, and you start from that. And if I could remember now, uh, it's by two guys at Cornell, and it must be, Jesus, I can't remember. It's published by Cambridge University Press, and it's a, a whole economics course starting with the network as the uh, sort of object of interest and moving from there. But there are very few people who teach you economics in that way. And the, the worst problem, and I'm not sure I should say this in front of Mark, because he has maybe colleagues here, is that some of the people who then call themselves heterodox are just critics of orthodox. So you can become a sort of um, a heterodox economist by not doing something different, but just by telling you people how bad orthodox e economics is. And that's not very good, because I mean, that's not going to help young people to develop uh, interesting ideas for dealing with the economy. So that's not a very good answer to your question, but um, uh, I don't know what I can say, right? But, uh, if, if you have the courage, I would go for doing what interests you, really interests you, and then look for opportunities to do that. And if you get very frustrated with doing that, then you write to me and I can suggest guys you can contact. <laughs> So my name is Jinan. Uh, my name is Jinan. I am from Bahrain. From Bahrain. Uh, ah, Bahrain. I never knew how to pronounce it. I'm glad you said that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I am Option C. I am from the developmental aspect. Uh, I have a question, which is, I think, uh, it's even complex in my mind, to be honest, which is the fact that 
there is now, the question is not if the economic is complex or not. I think it's more further than that, because even within the new mainstream, for example, that they are recognizing that the economics is now more complex, for example, you need the intervention of the state. But the question is how far you are recognizing this complexity and how far you are recognizing, for example, the role of the state in this aspect, how far you are recognizing the dynamic of different factors around in terms of politics, in terms of culture, in terms of social. If we notice, for example, between the heterodox economics, you have, for example, someone who criticized the mainstream and say, well, this aspect is not addressed, for example. And then you find another heterodox criticizing the, the first heterodox saying, okay, this is aspect also is not included. And it's just, it's, it's becoming more, uh, and like, as you said, it's more that this is cool is criticizing this is cool and this is cool is criticizing this is cool. But how far we are really addressing the whole aspect that we are facing in terms of, I, I will be more focused in terms of social, culture, history, political economy, and you have different countries. And it cannot be work to have the same economic model as you said for every country. It's, I think it's really, really, really complex, more than what we thought. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is my question. No, no, right. Um, and yet I, I, all I can say is that I agree with you very much. And um, sometimes when you hear groups of um, sort of economists who don't agree with the mainstream. It's a bit like, uh, you may have seen a film, Monty Python, um, The Life of Brian. And you may remember that the life of, in The Life of Brian, uh, Brian decides to become a sort of revolutionary Palestinian. And he meets with this group of people. And so the guy is there saying, well, what have the Romans done for us? And nothing. So he said, um, uh, who are our enemies? And somebody says, ah, it's the Palestinian, Palestinian Liberation People's Front. And, he said, and then somebody else says, no, 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 it's not. It's the op opposition to the current occupa occupation of Palestine group. No, 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 it's the other. And they go on talking about who their enemies are. And then somebody says, no, 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 it's, it's the Roman, Romans. Oh, yeah, we forgot about that. But instead, they start to fight amongst themselves about, um, you know, you must have seen this silly film, but it's... Um, very funny, and the, uh, the guy says, you know, what have the Romans done for us? Well, there was the water, and uh, right, well, the water. Forget about the water. Uh, uh, education, right? Well, they did do education, right? Forget about the water and the education. And then there were roads. Roads, right? Water. <laughs> and it goes on and on and on. But this is a bit like saying mainstream had something to say about these things. But, but I think that um, that's a, you, you know, as you said, uh, you, you don't want to have these quarreling groups about what's with, and what you add, also said is absolutely right. Everything is contextual in economics. It's contextual with respect to the society, the organization, the culture, and many things like this. And you can't take a model. And this is the main point of Bookstarper's book. He says, you know, it, you always start out with a model with N banks and L consumers and M so so, and we shouldn't do that. We should be identifying much more closely exactly who these people are how many of them there are, what they do, what the rules are in the particular economy or society you're studying, and not worry about some abstract thing. You can't arrive from Mars with a model of the economy and then just plant it anywhere. Because historically, what's happened is very important. Culturally, it's important. So economy can't be context-free. And the idea that it can be is just absurd. It's also, you can't transfer from one system to another directly um, a different way of looking at things. Let, let's take uh, a, a step on uh, very thin ice here now. Uh, the idea, Macron's idea, that we have to move from a system where people keep their jobs to a system where if you get out of a job, there's another job waiting for you. You know, flexi security, adapt that with no problem to France from the Scandinavian system. But that's completely against the way people think now. What people want now is a job, the steady job that they know that they will be paid for and that they know that they will have tomorrow. And when we don't live here in a society where people think, it doesn't matter if I'm out of work because I can always find another job. And that's not the same idea as having the idea that you had an employment, which is, and it takes time for the, the, uh, things to change, and, and maybe they shouldn't change in that way. Because there are many other consequences of when people are out of work. It's no good saying, oh, no problem, there's always a job in Paris. But you are, are in a, a factory 
in the Lorraine and that factory has now just gone out of business and it was producing iron and steel and now you say don't worry dear boy there are jobs near Paris but your house has just gone down in value and how are you going to move? You know you have very uh, the in, uh, the possibility for you to move, particularly if you say 50 or over, to move from De La Roy to Paris is almost impossible. So uh, the idea we can simply have a system of freer movement and so forth, we have to specify how that happens. And why does it work in Scandinavia? How did it develop such that it did work? All those are questions we have to ask, and it depends a lot on social, cultural, and other developments. It's, you can't think of the economy as being an abstract thing. It's very, very much contextual. Does that more or less an answer? <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, I'm Clara. I'm from Canada. Um, my question is, uh, kind of continues on what you were saying now about how specific uh, situation and context and history matters. Um, and also kind of contrast with some of the things that were said, said before in terms of how do we compete in terms of an alternative discourse uh, facing the mainstream uh, hegemony. Um, my question is, I, I'm wondering what should be the spectrum of analysis that we should use because if we want to be able to discuss these specificities um, and not abstract from some very complex real, real uh, economic issues, uh, Sometimes the macro uh, focus, that is the one also of the mainstream and also of uh, part of the heterodoxy, sorry I said it, um, <laughs> um, is, um, is not necessarily able to uh, really discuss the complexity and some of the specificity of, uh, of the economic systems. So I was wondering, yes, could you kind of comment on uh, the spectrum of analysis, should we actually move away from a kind of macro focus but keeping uh, that uh, the importance of data as being able to express something? But yes, yeah, sh should we as economists kind of move away from the macro? Yeah, I think um, moving away from the macro, what I think is uh, our real problem is that we want to justify what we say at the macro level by what happens at the micro level. And that's always going to be difficult. And it's very um, difficult to um, explain th the difference between the two. There's a, a Nobel Prize winner in physics, Phil Anderson, who wrote a book called More is Different, uh, a book, an article, sorry, in science, called More is Different. And what he explains there is something very important, that if you look at individuals, you can understand pretty much try to understand how they behave and, and what the laws are that govern their behavior, if there are laws. And, but even without dropping those laws, even though they may be correct, when you start to aggregate up the system, new laws emerge when you look at large, uh, large phenomena. And they may not be the same at all as the laws at the individual level. And so looking at the macro level, sometimes I, th I think we should have uh, not dropped the old idea, which was to have macro and micro, uh, by dropping it, we tried to make everything micro. So we have to, all the explanations up here are on the level of micro. This is how people react. And Keynes, in fact, was in part responsible for that. If you read the general theory, a lot of it refers loosely to the idea that this is how people behave, by which he means the average person behaves. And we shouldn't be doing that because what happens at the aggregate, sometimes you should just look at the aggregate level and see how that reacts. Uh, the chief economist at the Bank of England, Andy Haldane, said that his view of the world was that one day he would be like Mr. Spock and he would have a huge map of the financial sit situation in the world and he would watch this huge map and see whether there was a storm brewing somewhere or other and then he would try and work out what they should do about that. But he would not be there with a model of how this worked. He would be there just watching it and reacting to it. And, but that's a really macro idea, that you're looking at the macroeconomic phenomena and you stop worrying about precisely what the individual behavior underlying that was. It's also interesting to look at the individual behavior, but maybe for a macro uh, policy, sometimes we should concentrate on the macro phenomena and not focus. And the, um, the DSGE people are absolutely addicted to the idea, I want all of this to be based on individual 
behavior. And we shouldn't be thinking like that, I think. And uh, so if you say to me, precisely what sort of analysis do we need now? I can't tell you, but I do, do think that we should throw away this obsession with the isolated, optimizing individual and think about how this thing works together. And that's m really macro, not uh, micro. And sometimes it's not useful to know exactly how micro, the micro levels wor works. You, it may be interesting to know that uh, people have biases and so forth. Maybe some of those biases cancel out. Maybe they don't. But that's different from saying, I want to look at the macro level here and try and watch what the evolution is. So that's not a good answer to your question, but something to think about in the Shah. Any other question? No? Well. Maybe, maybe just, I, I have many comments or many questions, but I'll, I'll just stick to one. I was just wondering, I've been wondering for a long time, I've been wondering for a long time why it is that a number of economists, most economists, believe that all of the information is found in two prices. I mean, one would think that th there's a lot of, of, in of information in quantities, like uh, how much uh, I am selling, uh, what, what is my rate of utilization of my capacity, and so on. Why is it that in most mainstream economics, it is assumed that all of the information can be found in prices? Yeah, this is a, um, a, a very old question, Mark. And <laughs> the um, um, Hayek had uh, also this idea that uh, somehow the prices will magically convey the, um, the, the information that's underlying them. When I see the price move, that's because you did something. And if you uh, did more of that something, maybe the price would have moved more. But he thought of the price space, if you like, as being the place where the signals were. Why shouldn't it be the um, uh, signal of how much people did or, or why they didn't uh, trade more and so forth? And I think the only answer is that this simplifies things. It reduces the problem to the dimension of just prices. And that makes life much easier for us. And we have one vector that we have to look at. And uh, I think it's a, a kind of artificial belief. But there are many, many other things that tell you, give you information in fact. People don't look just at the prices. And in fact, anybody who really works on, at some point, uh, you should ask Jean-Philippe Bouchot to give a talk, because he's very good. And he r actually owns a hedge fund. And he would tell you that it's not just looking at the movements of the prices. It's also looking at various forms of um, the way in which those prices are evolving and so forth. And in addition, who is trading what? And how if you see large flows at a certain moment, then that in itself is a signal. And it's not just how much the price moved, but if you start to see big movements in terms of quantities, for example, um, I think it was yesterday or day before yesterday, the volume on the market changed enormously, and with it the volatility. But the relationship between two is not simple. So you're right that you can't just look at the prices, you have to look at the underlying you say, well, what happened here? Is this because a few people uh, got afraid, or is this because it was a large movement, a lot of trades being taking place, and so forth? So I think the answer is simplicity. But isn't that what economists have always been looking for? You want to get a model which is simple enough that you can analyze it, and you can solve it. And unfortunately, the world is not simple enough that you can analyze it and solve it. So that's not a good answer, but it's, it's an approximation to, an, uh, to a long answer. Uh, thank you very much for the very interesting questions and for the very insightful answers. Um, uh, thank you. <laughs>